Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a, it absolutely is a pleasure to be here. The, um, and uh, you know, as Meredith just reminded us, it's crazy to be on the stage and even more crazy to see so many uh, great professionals in the audience, many of whom we've had the pleasure of working with at the Ed School for many years. So, so thank you for all your, your assistance and help. I'll, uh, I'm gonna introduce the panel and then I just have a quick, uh, quick little anecdote and then we'll, we'll get started with the discussion. But uh, so Christopher Marcalis, the head of analytics and data governance, uh, data, and I, data and AI at CDWG. Thanks, Christopher. We have Herb Thompson, the state and local uh, government liaison for VMware. And Ryan Warabell, the CIO for Logic Monitor. So. So before I get started, I, I have to be honest, well, I'm overly transparent at times, so I'll, I'll share that quick tidbit. But um, the, uh, this is a, an intimidating topic to present to uh, this kind of uh, set of colleagues. But I will tell you that over the holiday break, I was sitting with my family at dinner, and I think we all recall the, the news headlines were filled with ChatGBT and all the crazy stuff that was coming out. And I had this, um, this moment, kind of a proclamation with my family. You know, my kids were all at the table, and I was like, this is the year that's going to change your lives forever. It was an epic. You know, I even had to look up the word E-P-O-C-H instead of E-A-P, but you get the point. And I could hear like the interstellar music in the background and I was really going to make an impact with my kids. I was like, this is, this is, this is a big deal. And um, so, you know, they were gracious. They entertained me for a minute and my son's like, well, give us an example. And I, I, I didn't like freeze, I'm very comfortable with my, my family, but I was like, well, what's an example? And I was like, somebody asked AI, or asked ChatGBT to create a banana bread, re bread recipe that didn't include eggs or oil. And it just created it in seconds. And the same awkward silence that is happening now, <laughs> happened at the dinner table. I thought I hit some like awe-inspiring, like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And instead it was like, uh. and then my, uh, my daughter uh, happened to chime in. She's like, dad, I saw that TikTok too. So, um, <laughs> so I, I share that with you only because I, I, I think my depth of understanding AI is uh, a little bit below the, the very, very shallowest part of, of, the, of the pool. But I, but I will say that it's an exciting topic. I think the university has so many exciting directions that uh, AI, uh, we can explore with AI, uh, the large language models, machine learning. It's, it's areas of research that the university has focused on literally for years, if not decades in, in, in some cases. And so the, the panel today isn't really designed to try to you know, boil the ocean with respect to AI. We talked, uh, you know, leading up to this conversation about trying to channel the, the discussion, stay in our lane, so to speak, with respect to the work that we all do as IT professionals at Harvard. And in that context, we're talking about how AI is probably going to influence the products that we use, the services we provide, and, and more importantly, what I hope to do is maybe like we maybe dig a little bit deeper so that everybody feels maybe just slightly more comfortable talking about AI with our staff, with our, uh, with our faculty, with our students, in ways that we're kind of open and transparent. Here's some things we don't know, here's some things that we do know, here's some opportunities that we see in the, in the couple of years that, that are ahead of us. Uh, but other than that, there's a lot of uncertainty here. There's a lot of promise, there's a lot of you know, excitement, but there's some risk. And I hope that the panel is able to uncover some of that as, as we share some uh, thoughts uh, this morning. And again, hopefully at the end of this, you won't have your own banana bread moment uh, with your colleagues. So with that, if you don't mind, we'll start with, uh, with Christopher. Uh, Christopher, could you share with us how uh, your view on how AI is going to impact technology and higher education? Kind of a big topic, but. It's a huge topic. So don't, don't ooh. <laughs> That's way better. So uh, don't turn off the mic, but it's gonna be devastating. It's gonna change everything. It's gonna ruin your lives, right? The same way that the IBM Select Tech typewriter did, um, the invention of the intranet by Al Gore, um, you know, uh, the, the Motorola StarTech flip phone, those white bricks that we had actually corded into our vehicles at the time that were not automatic. Do you remember when we had to, boop, to turn high beams on? 
I do. I've been around long enough. No, when I think about how AI is going to disrupt academia, you know, and, and really the world at large, I like analogies, right? So I'm going to talk to you about uh, Blockbuster. Are there people here old enough to remember Blockbuster? <laughs> right? So, you know, along came this upstart. It's like the Silicon Valley child of the era called Netflix. And, and if you guys don't remember, because we forget so easily, when you wanted to rent a movie, you had to go to a catalog. And you looked in that catalog and you found that title and you selected it. That sent an electronic communication to a printer somewhere in a warehouse that spat out a ticket that they put on an envelope where they shipped you a plastic disc. And that disc made its way through what used to be a fabulous postal service to our homes that we insert into a machine that was connected by cords and doodads to a giant tube TV. And then we watched the movie. Think about how disruptive that was in our lives back in those days. And, and then the innovations that came with that. All of a sudden, we could order the movies and watch them right away, right? Out with the post office, out with the printer, out with the plastic disc that goes in the thing connected to the tube. And so I'm going to say to you that AI is just as disruptive as Netflix or the cloud or telephones or the internet. And, and for academia, it's really important that we're ready for this because it won't be devastating. It can't be devastating if we're just aware. And we make certain to approach this with the diligence it deserves as an efficiency, as an opportunity to do more things with less resources. Um, I, I, I had to talk to ChatGPT before I even came up here today. How many of you have used ChatGPT? Don't lie. Okay, the rest of you, I question. Um, and, if, and if you haven't, talk to your colleagues who have their hands up next to you, but AI is just another form of technology that's going to make our lives differently better, but we do have to be ready for it. We have to talk about a lot of different things in my following questions. Great, thanks, Christopher. Uh, Ryan, you, uh, you know, again, we had some opportunities to sort of ruminate about, you know, what would be good things to, uh, to share in a, in a kind of an audience, but the, um, the buzz around AI generates a lot of emotions uh, from excitement to fear. But how do you see AI specifically contributing to the future of work? Sure. Um, and I remember when the remote was a cord that went all the way to the TV and you could slide back and forth. That was, yeah, it's great. Um, so a quick antidote, if you will, as well. Um, there was a great article in the Financial Times some time ago, and it talked about innovation and how it's changed the way we operate. And it referenced a book called What Do We Do When Machines Do Everything? The book talked about early 19th century innovations. It talked about the steamship, it talked about the telephones, it talked about different creations and inventions, sewing machine. But the one they focused on was one that uniformly and efficiently cut grass, otherwise known as a lawnmower. Not only did it cut grass, it cut fields. And it cut ball fields. And the authors decided that the foundation of a $620 billion field sports industry was based on the lawnmower. Bit of a stretch. But the idea that behind that is unforeseeable consequences. And I think that's where AI is for today. It's unforeseeable consequences. We have ideas about what's gonna change, how we're gonna work. We don't really know yet. If you think about industries that have changed, machines have created a way for more efficient, faster, more accurate processes. Manufacturing, cars, your, your idea. I see AI as doing something very similar. And if I think about the education industry, I see AI as a large augmentation tool as, a, as opposed to a replacement tool. I think education, an important part of education is the human touch, the interaction, the emotional concept, but the AI component can really help free up time of educators in that space. And it can, whether it's faster grading, whether it's uh, personalized curriculums, those things take a lot of time from educators today. And I think AI augments that and really leaves the emotion in place. So I think it's actually a really exciting uh, time for this industry, and I look forward to seeing the changes. Thank you. Herb, the, um, again, your unique position to be able to communicate directly with state and local governments. You know, what kind of trends are you seeing? You know, how are they thinking about AI? How are they thinking about sort of what's on the near horizon and you know, what, what might lie you know, a few years past that? Sure. <clears throat> so. I get a chance to travel a country and talk to state CIOs and city county CIOs and uh, higher ed CIOs. And AI, <clears throat> chat GPT, is really on the tip of everybody's tongue, right? And everybody is talking about it. But what I've seen in uh, state and local government is really 
this uh, retrenchment, I guess I'm gonna call it, everybody that is in a legislative position has watched the Terminator movies. They believe that Sarah Connor was right <laughs> and that AI, the robots are gonna take over. So they, across the country, we've seen it now, at least 20 states actually have implemented or are in the process of implementing bills to uh, kind of restrict and limit the way that AI is used in delivering public service. <clears throat> I was uh, with the state of Wisconsin in, in a former role, and I took care of child welfare systems, nursing home care, um, behavioral health facilities, correctional facilities, and we use data all the time in order to determine when to actually look at kids that are at risk and actually pull them out of households, which nursing homes to, to review, which child cares to review. And now with uh, AI, here's a chance for us to automate that entire decision-making process. The question is, should be, should we? And at what point in time does this decisions become so automated that we remove, remove the human element out of that. And so that's what uh, governments around the country are trying to do. Texas, for example, just passed a responsible AI decision-making bill that has uh, seven members, four from the outside, some legislators, and some from the state. Uh, Boston, for example, uh, actually has created another um, responsible AI built says experiment, 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 but only uh, apply it for these use cases to think about AI as a responsible decision-making element. And we've seen that in states like Vermont who've created a uh, department of AI to figure out when we should use it and when we shouldn't. And so if we can limit it to the cases where, you know, the generative AI or the large models or machine learning could be applied, I think it's of great, great value. Same thing in uh, education. But I've, I've seen uh, governments actually try to put the uh, governors on engines to, before it gets the horse gets out of the barn. It's, uh, it's an excellent segue. The, um, I'll say that, you know, the, the banana bread recipe, we never actually made the banana bread. So <laughs> in that context, could have been really good banana bread, could have been terrible. I think so, you know, getting into sort of that, that perspective of like, when should AI be used? When is the, are the results of ChatGPT and, and other AI products reliable enough that we should, uh, you know, put them in, in the foreground for, for supporting our, the, the work that we do? You know, I, I, this is kind of directed at, at Christopher, but I'd open it up to everybody. You know, what are the common misconceptions? You know, AI can't be good at everything. It's not general intelligence, it's artificial intelligence. And I think there's some themes there that are super important. But um, you know, what are the capabilities, what are the limitations that you feel most comfortable about talking with in, in front of a large audience that is sort of speak to, hey, it's, it's good at this, maybe not so good at that. And I'll, I'll start with Christopher. Wow, so um, AI doesn't know everything, okay? So there's a lot of misconceptions that people have that it, it's watching me, it's listening to me. You know, those are corporations, right? There's no autonomous robot <coughs> deity that's out there observing, right? So if it doesn't know everything, then what does it know? It knows what we teach it. It knows about the patterns that we distill into it. It knows about those patterns and how to use them in the real world because we train it. Um, you know, when I think about all, all of the opportunity to use AI, I would say go for it, you know, head first, dive in and, and use it. It's like me asking you to stop using keyboards and mice and electricity and antibiotics. You know, AI, AI is going to be out there. And, and I think the biggest thing you have to, to think about when you're using technologies like ChatGPT, which is coming up every single day with customers that I'm talking to. I mean, they want to use it for everything. Is this organ going to survive if I transplant it? Will this person default on their loan? You know, is the sky going to be blue tomorrow? I don't know. Did we teach it to observe these things? So, so the challenge is like, where can I find places to use it? And ultimately I would treat it just like I do my KitchenAid mixer, my keyboard, my mouse, my computer, where it brings efficiencies to what I do every day. Because at the end of the moment, you are that human element that's making a decision. And if I can use AI responsibly, it's hard to say that, right? Um, I, I can find myself creating efficiencies, 10, 15, 20, 30% of my day, if I could shift those activities, those mundane things, like screening the unrealistic number of emails I get and putting them aside in the drunk folder for me, that's huge, right? Should I use AI for that? 
Yeah, right? Focus time on my Outlook calendar? Absolutely. But again, I wouldn't necessarily ask ChatGPT if I should sell my home and buy a home in a different division because it's gentrifying. Because there's context missing, there's knowledge missing, there's patterns missing, there's training missing. I think there's emotion missing too. Let's yeah, talk about absolutely. that a little on the education side. I think where AI, there's a term called interaction labor, and it's a kind of a spot that's been untouched by automation in the past or relatively. Customer service, hospitality roles, education, as we talked about others. You don't buy, if you think about a sales rep, you don't buy from a computer necessarily if you're buying a large, making a large purchase. You wanna have an emotional connection, a talk, uh, a conversation. Um, if I'm buying software for, from a vendor, it's, it's, I need that relationship. So I think that's where AI doesn't get too involved. It augments, as we talked about earlier. Um, it, will it replace jobs? 100%. Will it create new jobs? 1,000%, right? That's the interesting thing. Um, we were talking about downstairs earlier, and, and her brought up that, what, 60% of the top jobs uh, in 2030 don't exist today. Yeah, 80%. Um, 80% of the new jobs created by 2030 don't exist yet. So you think about, think about that. There's a, there's a ton of new inventions that are going to go on between now and then. Yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, Ryan, the, um, obviously with, with Logic Monitor, thinking about you know, the, the kinds of investments you're making in your product lines, can you talk a little bit about you know, where you see generative AI tools like ChatGPT fitting into your product lines? Sure. Um, so for those that don't know Logic Monitor, um, we're an IT observability tool. So we look across networks, infrastructure, um, applications, and really help to understand what's going on or see patterns um, help help uh, support um, you know your general uptimes. So if I think about our products and what we're looking at, um, you know there are lots of capabilities that are out there today. Um, you know, creative content writing, um, sketching designs, and so forth, all very interesting. What we are thinking about for our product is what is that next evolution of of AI? It is things like basic chatbots for support. Um, it is things like uh, Build me a dashboard that shows me my network traffic. Um, it is things like help me resolve my, my issue and reduce my MTTR time, or how do I prevent future outages, right? Very creative things. We're not there yet. Um, and our position is we don't know the un unforeseen uh, consequences of some of these decisions. So we are taking a very slow, responsible approach. Um, and while we're thinking about it and we're testing, and we're gonna to start to run some internal hackathons and really test internally to understand the challenges because what we can't do is you know, risk our customers, risk our product, risk IP, risk personal data. Um, we know today that AI has hallucinogenic responses. We know that it has misinformation that comes because the data sets aren't always accurate that it's pulling from. We know that we don't wanna put our information out in public domain for consumption. So it's a slow, responsible approach, um, but we certainly are thinking about some of the ideas that are out there. That's great. Uh, Herb, the, um, from a technology company perspective, how are you, how are you all thinking about it? And uh, just to uh, remember, uh, VMware sure. is. Uh, so, you know, I work for uh, VMware, so we are, uh, I'm gonna say a data center automation, a security company, and a end user computing employee experience uh, company. So we've been baking uh, AI into our solutions for a long period of time. Uh, from the, in the data center business, where you have uh, so many activities that go on with computers that are self-correcting. So we call it uh, basically like a self-driving data center. And we've been using AI to monitor all the logs, activities, and then take create, creative uh, creative and corrective actions on the fly without manual intervention. That's been going on forever. In the security products, and I can, you can name 100 different security products all doing the same thing, understanding all the threat landscape, understanding what's going on, and by you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of transactions, trillions of transactions, you know, in you know, petabytes after petabytes of daily logs, understanding what is actually taking place with these multifaceted attacks and being able to respond very quickly to be able to shut them down. So we've been baking AI into our products for a long time, along with every, 
every other uh, company on the planet. And everybody's trying to figure out where and when to use generative AI to actually create the differentiation in your product that uh, is gonna come to market. So I, uh, I think that we are in this uh, very, very lightning fast environment where we're trying to figure out what is the responsibility and the, the efficiency that we can gain, but also to reduce our risk of liability of actually doing the wrong thing. You know, it hasn't really been proven out in courts yet, but it will. You can guarantee that something's gonna happen. UK is right now working on an AI, AI act that will actually, you know, guarantee, kind of, guarantee, but reduce uh, issues about privacy and bias. And I think that that is gonna play out over this next year uh, in the UK, in the US and around the country. As soon as you start to, start to do uh, public services and you deny people claims, you deny what's going on, it's gonna be proven in a court. You know, and then the question is, well, this was based upon an AI model. Can you prove that it was unbiased. Just one quick story, one quick story. Uh, uh, city of New York, uh, uh, the child welfare group in New York uh, was doing experimentations with AI and decision-making when to remove a kid from an abusive household. And so they do predictive models going, we need to go do a quality assurance and an, a home investigation on these households. And what they found is they had bias in the data. So they had to remove a number of factors, a number of data sets to remove that biasness out of it. And I think you're gonna see that play out over and over and over. Which is, which is a great way to segue into this next question. This is directed at you, Christopher, but you know, obviously a lot of colleagues in, in the audience you know, are directly supporting the, the university research and, and the work that goes on here, as, uh, as many of us know. But the, uh, you know, how do you see AI influencing data science in general and the, and the systems that support it, the work that goes into it? It's gonna change things, right? So to, to ignore that this change is coming would be foolish. To, to know that I can take care of mundane, repetitive tasks that I can teach a child to do um, and, and be averse to that is, 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 has consequences, right? So how is it going to change data science? Think about, you guys have all heard of this thing called AutoML, right? All the big cloud vendors are there like, yeah, use this service, it's instant and it does it itself as well as we've trained it to. Um, so, you know, we're going to find efficiencies in building data science models. I and, mean, you know, you guys hear AI, data science, machine learning, AI ops, ML ops, it's all in the same bucket of fun. At the end of the day, you get a bunch of people together, one or more people, I should say, because data scientists can be totally independent. And they, they distill all the wisdom in the room into a set of business rules to say, I'm trying to anticipate an outcome. Here's all the inputs that I think it might be. And you run it through this process where uh, the different algorithms might be used to build a model to say, I can predict an outcome. Now, when, when you do that, there's a lot of work that goes into building the model. There's a lot of data curation. And you all are gonna tell me that all the data you guys work with every day is perfect, right? All the numbers are accurate, it's in the right place, it's accessible, it's super fast, the dashboards are instant, right? So putting that aside, when I have the capabilities of AI and how it's infusing itself in all the different domains of IT, I can sometimes accelerate the curation of that data, the quality of that data, the movement of the data, and the, how it comes to a data science model. I can use that even to assist me in training that data science model. Do you guys all know about training data science models? This is really key to understand in AI. It can only do what it knows to do, what we've taught it to do. But it's, it's kind of like, um, it's like academia. So a, a data science model, a machine learning model, starts in K-12. We teach it all the things we want it to know to observe certain specific patterns of, of behavior and action and outcome. And then we push it off into higher education where it can be independent and see if it figured it out, right? But it's a supervised experiment because we have people here who are assisting and observing and giving back participation trophies and wagging their fingers. Because if we see them not observing the patterns that we taught them to observe, we course correct them. So we give feedback. A continuous learning model is built here in higher ed until we know that, that that model can be put out into the world. So there's efficiencies to be had. Um, you know, there's capabilities that, that, that we're gonna have to kind of stumble through to figure out, but you know, I could keep rambling on, but I'd like to hear what you guys have to say. 
So I, it's, it's an interesting point, and I think about the challenges of being a CIO at uh, any size company, mid-size, large, that you have. Data is almost always the number one challenge, and you, you get pushback from your, your organization on, I just need more data. The problem is that data is there, but it may not be formatted in the right model, it may not be um, segregated correctly, it might uh, you know, just not be set up correctly at all. Master data management impl um, implementations are one of the highest failing types of implementations there are. Um, everybody tells you there's a magic button and that you can all of a sudden have this, this fantastic MDM solution, they fail all the time because there's a lack of discipline in the organization. And when you have a lack of discipline, you have uh, incorrect data. Um, to your point, AI is only as good as the data that, that it's pulling from, um, which is why it's still today uh, a little scary that, that people are buying into all of these different different ideas about the generation of that, the data that it's putting out. Um, and it's also why we have to be very careful about how much we believe until we start to understand what, what's the data it's pulling from. Um, you know, I think about just internally today, AI aside, trying to build a basic report and that doesn't have any manual interventions, it's a challenge. Um, if you think about when we pull our, our financials at the end of a quarter, I, it scares me to think about how much our accountants manipulate the data to make sure that it shows the way that it should be, right? You can't just run your general reports. Um, and it's not that they're manipulating incorrectly, but the systems just aren't set up right to basically bring all the data in, whether it's trying to reconcile usage data and how much we're charging customers on usage versus licensing versus the different models and every um, exception to every contract that we've, we've done with our customers. Sometimes the, the systems aren't smart enough to track that. So to think about an automated, a full automated AI model to produce that information, it's, it's a little scary. Um, so there is a lot of work left to be done to make sure that what we're actually generating out of AI-enabled tools is, is um, accurate and defensible. You know, I, I, you just reminded me to actually answer the question differently. So I'm thinking about how does data science change in the face of AI automation? And, and there's a product, that can, a whole bunch of products in the market that help you accelerate data science, right? I'm a point and click guy. I was born in 78. So I was taught drag and drop GUIs you know, C++, Cobalt, those languages were going away. Now we're teaching kids R and Python and Scala. Don't know why, but now we're going back to the GUIs again. But like a lot of these data science tools are now infusing these large language models for explainability. You wanna talk about making AI, making analytics, making data accessible to normal people, right? Data science model, ensemble model that's predicting the likeliness of a student to drop out of school. Well, when you get to the end of it, it's a bunch of math and statistics and data going into it, and it explains it to you the same way a statistics you know, professor might explain the, the reason you didn't do so well in class. With large language models, it comes to an outcome with a confidence score, and then it explains it in English. They're adding this now to the tooling so that it can give a, a solution to a normal person and say, predict an outcome, and when you get to the math part, the explanation part that requires a PhD, it translates that into English. This model predicts the likeliness of a student to have the propensity to fall out of class. And, and then it goes through the math in English. And so, you know, large language models are going to be very important and pivotal to our understanding of how we use tools and how we digest data that we may not be familiar with. And we don't need to be PhDs to figure this out. I just need to understand and defend what I'm about to use for work in, in my day-to-day -day lives. But, but speaking to like large language models, you know, how do institutions universities, governments, what have you, in, uh, companies, how do they think about taking their own institutional data and, and making it ready first and then putting it out there in a way that it's, you know, obviously there's huge privacy concerns, there's, there's sensitivities of, of, other, of other needs, but, but how do you take your data and structure it, design it, think about it in a way that feels like it could be ready for AI in a year or two or three? I don't know if you've, if you've thought about that within your own organizations or if you try to tackle that. It seems real interesting to, to you know, throw something at ChatGPT and get all kinds of crazy things that might come out of the, the, the global information store that's the internet. But when you start to look at something that's far more uh, contextually defined, what does that look like or have you seen that in, in your work? Well, let me just throw in um, something, right? So I'm, I come from a public service, social service background. Uh, across the country, we've been trying to figure out how to provide uh, efficient and effective services to 
not only individuals and but uh, households, and then the interrelationship with households. So a dollar spent um, on a service, and, and in Wisconsin we said, if you are known to one public service, you know, you're taking one, whether that's child care or child support, you're probably known to seven others. You know, so the potential for integrated eligibility, seven different services from one individual, from one household. And then the interrelationship between the kids, you know, uh, divorced parents and then divorced parents have uh, siblings. And now pretty soon this interconnected web. And am I applying the, the social service dollar to the most effective person? We've been trying to do that for years. And across the country, 89% uh, of the states already have identity and access management programs for citizens going on today. The idea of I'm known, known to a particular service, but then I'm known to all services. The idea of a citizen 360 view of all the services you're known to the state. We've been trying to do that for years, and we've actually made a lot of success over the past five years a tremendous amount of you know, creating a single ID for an individual just for this particular purpose. I think the, uh, the, the timing is right because we've been doing data science and we've been doing analytics and cleaning up our data in individual silos in order to do this federated data model to be able to apply service. And I think now we have the, we're starting to see the tools arise that allow us to actually start you know, building upon it. The question becomes, how much should we use it? And is there going to be privacy issues when we start to actually delve into it? And the answer is yes. So you have to step back and take a close look at what you're gonna deliver. Because if you deliver a dollar to an individual, how do you know that's gonna be effective and, and it's gonna be unbiased? And so that's, that's what's going on in state government. I think everybody's, you know, juiced up for it. Mm -hmm. Um, but that cautious approach, responsible. So in, in the interest of self-preservation for the people in this room, to get ready for AI, you should be cautious with the data you expose. Chat GPT is based on open source technology. When you submit your, your content, because I don't want to say it's always a question, sometimes you paste things, it becomes public knowledge. It becomes intellectual property for other people. So, you know, if you want uh, a great example of that, look in the news about six to eight weeks ago, some Samsung uh, semiconductor employees, they were building a fancy new software product and they were stuck because, you know, coding. And uh, they decided that why not ChatGPT? They pasted the entirety of a whole program in ChatGPT, the public facing open source solution uh, to try and resolve the coding issues they were having. They got what they were looking for. What they didn't know that they were doing was sharing all their intellectual property and passing it forward to the open domain. Guess what's happened to those folks? Um, you know, so if you're going to get ready for, for AI, get ready for large language models, you know, I do want to get on a big soapbox and talk about data governance and data quality and data tagging and data management and performing platforms, but I'd also like you to hang around, you know, keep your jobs. So let's focus on, you know, if you're gonna play and dabble, let's look at, you know, using closed systems where I can teach them and train them and put them in the bubble that we otherwise hide behind, right? Uh, and behind cybersecurity, because that's really important, you know, and there's efficiencies to be had out there without sharing all of your secrets. Thank you. The, um, obviously, we have a great representation of the IT community across Harvard. The, um, it, just as a, sort of some parting thoughts on like, hey, what are those core critical skills that your own groups may be thinking of when you're looking to hire people who are going to advance AI work in your own areas? You know, what, what are those things that are really sort of standing out in terms of people's aptitudes or career skills or, or what have you? Uh, I'm happy to start. Um, I think the, the thing that for us is you need to be able to think differently. Um, the world is changing, everything around us is, is going to change, and it continuously does, especially in the technology world. So there is a lot to be gained from people who come in with an open mind and think just about different aspects. Um, data science obviously is a huge push, and people that understand data and how it works, 
big driver. Um, we're really seeing a lot of interest and in, in growth in that space. Um, so people who have a, a lot of research backgrounds are, are kind of coming into that area. Um, we're, we're getting away from your core developers. Um, there, there's certainly still a need for engineering. There's still a need for um, you know, people that can, can write code, but QA is a, is a perfect example. QA is, is becoming much more automated these days, not the required skill. So it's, it's just kind of reskilling a lot of the tool sets I think is important and, and keeping more up to date. Super. Um, I'm going to say Python, Java, so some basic link, Python, Java, machine learning engineer, deep learning engineers, this whole in, robotic engineering, I think uh, that's uh, going to be critical skills. And I'm just going to relate a quick story. I was talking to the CIO from Washington State University, and they were playing around with Python for AI, and they built a uh, counselor program. The problem was 300 students, one counselor. And so they developed this uh, model based upon what courses the, the individual student was going to take and when the schedules were, when courses were offered and they matched up, yeah, and suggested schedules for the student so they didn't have to actually visit a personal counselor. Or if they did, they could do that. So I think uh, the basically the AI skill sets around you know, those technologies are going to be critical moving forward. Thank you. Be, will, be like water. Go with the flow. Embrace the technology. Learn to use it. Don't be the curmudgeon. Because at the end of the day, you don't want to be left behind. You know, think again of all the analogies I use today. Typewriters, computers, the internet, Netflix. It's important that unless you're going to be a programmer, I'm going to be controversial and say, I don't care about the languages because I'm not that guy. I'm a normal person that wants to get things done. So expose yourself to the technology platforms. Don't just say no to them. I had a customer say, I want to use ChatGPT to decide if this customer is going to default on their loan or not. And it was a business to business transaction. It turned into a productive conversation because what large language models afforded us to do was analyze the hundreds of emails and applications and PDFs and attachments and tax returns and Schedule Cs that that person would bring to the equation and it became one more feature in a data science model to evaluate and understand default, right? It's not a no, it's a maybe and figure it out. I think that's a really um, important point, Chris. And, and if you think about software companies and technology companies that are out there today, they are popping up like crazy. We, as, as a CIO, I, I, I can't keep track of what, what's available out there. They, we, I pay people to tell me what new companies and new capabilities that are out there because you just can't keep up with it all. So not tying yourself to technologies, I think, is a really important aspect. There are certain skills that are required, but not tying yourself to something in particular because it's going to change. The amount of startups that are out there that are creating just amazing capabilities that we haven't even heard of yet, um, that are getting seed money and running with it, they're going to be. Some of them are going to be wildly successful, and uh, you just you just can't keep track of all the, the dollars that are that are flowing. Well, super. I think we're at time. Uh, I want to be respectful of the schedule for today, but thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you for our, our panelists here. Appreciate your thoughts and perspectives. Sure. Thank you.